uh, welcome you to today's webinar on the five dysfunctions of a team. Uh, this is a, <clears throat> a talk really about the influence of one book on uh, my life, and that is uh, the book by Patrick Lencioni, which you can see there on our first slide, <clears throat> The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, which he wrote some years ago. And I was very privileged to meet Patrick uh, at a conference in the, the UK uh, some years ago, and uh, we had a fantastic uh, chat. Uh, he's a very approachable guy and uh, in fact I was able to speak to him on two separate occasions and we talked uh, about a number of subjects certainly one of which was uh, you know sort of the state of the world kind of thing where is the corporate world going where is business going and then of course uh, we had a chat about teams as I have uh, always found myself in some kind of a team environment uh, in the in my career so um, what I'm going to be discussing is essentially what Patrick lays out in this book. However, all of the uh, you know personal examples that I'll provide will be uh, those of of, uh, of my own. Um, I do have permission to uh, to use the images or the uh, designs from his book directly from him, and um, and that's why I've mentioned there that it's used by permission of the Table Group, which is his company, and by Patrick Lencioni himself. So just a little bit about a uh, little bit about me. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I've been in the uh, uh, program and project management area of um, uh, research and development in biotechnology in the pharmaceutical industries for over 30 years. Um, I've worked on uh, enterprise project management implementations and I've really focused on uh, portfolio program and project management. Um, been involved in a lot of organizational design, change management issues, especially around project teams and team structures and uh, moving organizations from a traditional sort of functional area uh, management uh, structure toward more of a matrix type structure and that'll be very relevant to our discussion today. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, all the material in this uh, slide presentation is based on the book and uh, the stories are mine. So I'd like you to just imagine for a while, this is uh, going to be sort of a blue sky, but let's pretend for a moment that you are thinking about teams and you want to um, just allow your mind to sort of go freely in, in terms of what would a team environment look like for you. And, uh, and so we're going to walk through some, some ideas here and just see um, how we respond to these things, and I'm willing to uh, I'm willing to bet that as we get into these uh, lists of things, you're probably going to start wondering where on the planet does such a thing actually exist. But there's a reason we're going to do this. So imagine a team where the members of the team trust one another, trust one another. Imagine a team where team members engage in unfiltered conflict around ideas. What I mean by that is unfiltered means that they're not sitting there going, well, I shouldn't bring that up, I, I can't talk about that, um, that's politically incorrect, or you know, so-and-so will be upset if I bring that up because of this, that, or the next thing. Um, unfiltered means that they don't think that way. They think, okay, I have something I want to discuss, and we want to have engage in a discussion which inevitably results in some kind of conflict between the team members but it's related to ideas it's not about being personal it's not about you know getting upset with one another uh, but it's allowing for unfiltered conflict around ideas imagine a team where the team members commit to decisions and to plans of action not that some kind of hum and haw and and others might say well you know I don't really think so, but if you want to do that, you know, I'm not going to stop you. But really commit to decisions, and they really commit to plans of action. What are we going to do now that we've made this decision? Um, the fourth thing that these members do is they hold one another accountable for delivering against those plans. So it's one thing to say, all right, I commit to this plan of action, but these team members actually hold each other accountable to deliver against those plans. So if one of the team members is not delivering against the plan that they agreed on, the other team members would basically say, hey, you know, what's going on? You know, you committed, where are you at with it? 
Imagine a team where the members focus on the achievement of collective results. Now, this is really, really interesting um, point because it's easy, I think, we've all had experience where we've been a part of a team or a group where you can just tell that people have their own agendas. They're, they're in it for themselves. Um, but imagine a world or a team where you are actually part of a team that is focused on what you do together and only what you do together. Sure, each individual gets you know, their recognition, but at the end of the day, they care more about the team and the collective results of the team. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's do a little team test. So before I do that, um, you've probably listened to those five points and you're probably thinking to yourself, my goodness, that sounds great, Don, but it's really you know pie in the sky kind of stuff, isn't it? I mean, I don't know anybody or any company that has a team like that, or perhaps you do. Um, and, and you're probably wondering, you know, so what's the point here? I mean, it's great to, to imagine and to sort of project forward and say it would be nice to be a part of something like that or to actually witness or experience a team environment like that. But is it even possible? Well, we're going to talk about that today. So before we do that, let's, uh, let's move on and do a little team test. And uh, this is kind of similar to the Imagine slide, but it's a lot more specific now around um, what teams can be measured against. And uh, so I've got 12 points here that I want to go through um, that discuss in more detail how teams um, actually behave. And I think this is the key here um, at this point in, in the webinar for you to understand is that I'm focusing on team behaviors um, <clears throat> and because there's inevitably going to be questions about well how do we move from you know where we are to where we need to be assuming that you're in a team or you're about to be part of a team or perhaps you've had a very bad team experience at the end of the day how do you get to this sort of so-called imagined world how do you get to the place where the, the points on this team test are actually a reality or many of them are a reality and so we're gonna we're gonna just look at some of these behaviors now so here's a team test uh, the first one is the team members are passionate and unguarded in their discussion of issues um, it's interesting the key word there I want to focus on is unguarded and it goes back to um, what I said earlier about unfiltered conflict in order for teams to be successful, it's important for them to be able to talk without having to worry about what's going to happen if they say this or say that. Uh, the second uh, word that I want to highlight here is, is the word passionate. It's not a case of just showing up for meetings, but actually being engaged and being involved and caring about the subject matter that uh, is being discussed. Team members call out one another's deficiencies or unproductive behaviors. Um, again, this is not something that is very common uh, in many, many companies. Certainly, in order to uh, highlight somebody's deficiency or their unproductive behavior, the typical way this is done is by appealing to that individual's uh, superior. So if someone is consistently deficient or unproductive, then you know comments start to be made behind closed doors about so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. um, the notion that the team members would actually speak directly to the individual and point these things out uh, is not common, but should be if you're going to have a successful team. Team members know what their peers are working on and how they contribute to the collective good of the team. Uh, this is a really good test for a team and the reason is that it's relatively easy to come together and to be part of a team and say hey I'm on this team or that team but at the end of the day what do the rest of the members of that team know about what you're doing do you come together for the meetings to share a very filtered amount of information and at the rest of the time nobody knows actually what uh, that team member is doing or is it a situation where all the team members actually have a general understanding and more or less specifics as required on what every team member is actually doing and sort of corollary to this is do any of those team members 
get upset if another team member says, hey, how's it going with X or how's it going with Y? They don't feel like, oh my goodness, this is my territory. You have no right to ask me what I'm doing because you know you go and worry about what you're doing. Well, that's not team behavior. Team behavior is, hey, we're all part of one team. We all have our own things that we're doing and there are essentially no no-go zones when it comes to team activities. Here's a fourth team test. <clears throat> team members quickly and genuinely apologize to one another when they say or do something inappropriate or possibly damaging to the team. So there's two points to this, uh, this particular test. The first one is that uh, it's about personal things. So if you say something to someone in a team and you actually do offend them, uh, they would hopefully tell you so, probably uh, depending on the individual, it might be a, uh, something they do behind closed doors or they may even do it publicly as a team. It depends on the maturity level of the team to handle something like that. But basically, there's, there isn't a, a begrudging sort of, well, you know, um, you know I, I, I meant what I said and I'm not taking it back. It's rather, it's a, hey, I didn't mean to you know, upset you. So that covers the personal side. But then there's the second aspect of this bullet point and that is the the possibility of damage to the team. And a good team test uh, on this point is, is that people are on the lookout for what is damaging to the team. It almost becomes more important than it does the individual as teams mature because they recognize that for the success of any team, they have to be on the lookout for uh, behaviors that might damage the team. Now, of course, those are often uh, at an individual level, but as I say, uh, as teams mature, they tend to focus more on whether or not this is something that will hurt us as a team as opposed to I personally am upset by this or that. Team members willingly make sacrifices uh, in their departments or areas of expertise for the good of the team. Again, <clears throat> this is very much related to uh, the organizational structure that the team is based in. So perhaps at this juncture I can just sort of talk a little bit about that. Um, in the project management world we talk about the different types of um, organizational structures that may exist. Uh, on the left hand side of the uh, spectrum you have a, a classical uh, functional area type organization where the departmental heads basically have a, a vertical uh, command and control structure in place and they <clears throat> they basically rule uh, the roost in terms of what's whatever is happening uh, in that company and if they were to introduce the concept of projects they may provide a project team member but at the end of the day that project manager that's running that team has absolutely no authority or leadership uh, accountability really uh, they tend to be sort of uh, meeting minutes takers and uh, that's about the sum total of what they do providing the odd report um, the functionary managers are, are have the real power if you like um, on the extreme right hand side of the spectrum uh, are what we call fully projectized organizations and that's where there are no departments there are no functional heads or uh, very few of them everything is a project and all work that is done is a project. In these types of organizations, of course, the project manager uh, is king uh, or queen and runs, uh, runs everything and drives everything um, uh, from that perspective. Now, of course, um, there is every flavor of mixture in between. And so the classical sort of middle point on that spectrum is what we would call a balanced matrix design and that's where you have the functional area managers uh, providing the resources to the project team and the project manager um, leading and managing that project team and both essentially having uh, you know responsibility and accountability for the team and the team members. Uh, that's a balanced matrix design so essentially each project team member ends up having two bosses. Um, and this is a not uncommon uh, structure, certainly one that I am very familiar with. I have had um, been in a balanced matrix design um, several uh, points in my own career and, <clears throat> and I've also uh, had the opportunity uh, to move organizations that were 
uh, more functional area based toward more of a uh, balanced matrix design and even into what we would call a strong matrix where the project manager has even more authority and accountability. Now, I tell you all that as background to this fifth point because it really will depend on where you are in the spectrum as to how much um, this particular test of the team is going to uh, be, you know, be revealed. So in this particular point, team members making sacrifices related to things like budget, turf, headcount, etc. Um, where this uh, you tend to see this is it, it more in a in a balanced or strong matrix design. To the degree that the organization is still operating within a functional matrix design, there tends to be this sort of guarding of turf, uh, guarding of my budget, my headcount, and. Uh, if the team should need more expertise in another area and that manager doesn't have headcount for it, well, then that's just too bad. They have to find some other way to, uh, to, to get along and typically uh, the team would suffer. However, um, in more of a balanced matrix or strong matrix design, the, the, um, the heads of those departments would be on the lookout for where the team is actually suffering from a headcount perspective and would be actually willing to offer up budget in their own area um, where uh, they feel it's more important that the team benefit from it. And again, I have seen this happen uh, where one uh, departmental head uh, had budget that was unspent and said, look, you need another head, I can do without, so why don't we pass my budget over into your area and you hire them and then put them on the project team. So that's, uh, that is something that I have seen and it's a really good test of how much um, uh, the functional area managers actually understand the importance of the team. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. We're gonna continue with some more team tests. Um, team members openly admit their weaknesses and mistakes. Wow, this is a big one. Um, and we're gonna get to how do you do all this in a moment. But the foundation of this, of course, is a degree of maturity amongst the team members and a very, very important word that we're going to be talking a lot about uh, shortly, and that is the word trust. So in this particular test, um, what a team is looking to show is that it's okay if I admit that I'm not really strong in this particular area. and. Uh, Secondly, if I actually make a mistake, I quickly admit to it and receive feedback from the team on how to A, avoid it going forward and B, how to improve. So a good team test is how often does this happen? If people never share where they feel that they're not quite confident to do something, and we're not talking about you know, people coming to meetings and going, well, I don't, you know, I don't really feel like I can do this or I don't want to do that. Um, but really just being open about, hey, look, here's where I'm strong, but I'm not so strong over here. Do you think, you know, Charlie, you could help me out with this or, or uh, Susie, you could jump in here because I need some support. It's that kind of openness that we're talking about. And of course, um, the admission of mistakes is a really good indicator, a litmus test of how mature a team is. Team meetings are compelling, not boring. <laughs> uh, I'm sure if people's microphones were unmuted, uh, I'd hear lots of laughter on this one. Um, I've been in many, many meetings, as I'm sure uh, you have, where meetings are really boring, especially the team meeting, because <clears throat> what often happens in team meetings is people come together to basically give an update on what they're doing. And the problem with that, of course, is that uh, meetings should not be for the sharing of updates on information that could be commonly known. Meetings should be used to make decisions, to share critical information or very, very recent, as in five minutes before I came to the meeting, this happened kind of information, and then discussing and making decisions around that as a team. One of the common problems that I have seen in the organizations that I've been a part of is that team meetings tend to be meetings where everybody updates everybody else. And of course, that's what leads to the boredom. It's what leads to people saying things like, you know what, 
Um, can I just share my five minute update and then leave because I'm so busy I've got to get back to my job? Well, that's not team behavior and it's not a team meeting. That's just a, hey, I'm here to, to let everybody know what I've been doing because I have no way to communicate that. And that's a problem. And so there are lots of great solutions out there, um, most of which are rooted in some kind of IT where you can share and keep up to date on project information. And uh, I've personally been involved in building and, um, and rolling out project management information systems. Um, used enterprise project management, of course, is, is a classic example, but there are others where you basically um, want to encourage teams to share and keep information readily available to all the team members and you can stratify that information as much as you want. You can have an, you know, an executive view, you can have a project team view, you can have a functional area manager, supervisor, uh, um, you know, a spectrum for them. But at the end of the day, no team member is coming to a meeting to tell other team members what they're doing. They should already know that. And so they should be coming to those meetings in order to share um, the critical pieces and then to make decisions and develop action plans around it. If that is actually happening in a team meeting, then I can guarantee you they will not be boring. Uh, there will be lots of discussion and there will be conflict around ideas going back to our first point. And that's why they're not boring. So I submit that the reason why team meetings are often boring is because they're based in just sharing information, which I would agree is very boring. Okay, so let's move on to number eight. Team meetings, uh, sorry, team members leave meetings confident that their peers are completely committed to the decisions that were agreed on, even if there was initial disagreement. So again, this uh, plays into the, uh, the comments I was just making around team meetings. Um, if you have a team meeting where you are not sharing information but rather uh, you know making decisions critical decisions uh, there will probably be disagreement as that meeting uh, gets going however um, based on some of the other team litmus tests that we've shared even up until now the previous seven uh, you can see that a, a healthy mature functioning team is uh, is going to be able to disagree but the point is that they want to seek for uh, consensus and to moving forward with an action plan. And also, if they do so, then all the team members will commit to that. There won't be people going, well, you know, I don't really agree with that. Um, you get a classic situation in this, in this kind of environment where you'll get a person on a team who will say, you know, yeah, okay, I'm not really sure I, I buy this, but I'll go along with the team. And then not a week later or maybe two weeks later, a situation will come up where that team is presenting, let's say, to an executive uh, member and the team will start out sharing that, you know, they're going to do this or that and the next thing. And that person who was really not on board says, well, actually, you know, I didn't really support that decision. Well, in that situation, you just killed the team because you've just revealed the fact to the executive member that the team actually wasn't a team at all. It was a bunch of people that either railroaded somebody into doing something or it was a team where a member didn't agree but said they agreed and then waited for the opportune moment to say, you know what, I don't really agree. And we'll see just now how this is a very, very dangerous and very, very um, uh, difficult thing to recover from because you undermine the confidence um, that executives should have in project teams and you undermine the confidence of those team members. It, if, it effectively amounts to a, a public betrayal, if you like, of the team. And so it's important that all of these tests and all of these points we've talked about tend to build on one another and we'll see a little bit more about that in a moment. Morale is significantly affected by the failure to achieve team goals. So this gets back to one of the earlier uh, bullet points about the focus being more on the team than on the individual. Um, it's one thing for individuals uh, to have a morale challenge from time to time. We all get down. Uh, we all have our bad days. But 
in a really good team, in a team that's mature and functioning well, um, they're more concerned about how the team is doing. And if they're going to get down and, have, and, have, and suffer a, 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 you know, a confidence in, with, with respect to morale, it's going to be more related to how the team did, uh, did rather than how they did. And um, so if you've been paying attention up until this point in time, we've only got a few more points on these team tests, the, the key message here, and this is certainly shouldn't be new to anyone listening, but um, there's more of an emphasis obviously on the we and uh, much less emphasis on the I. And that's just fundamental to uh, what makes a team a team, of course. It's easy to say, and it sounds like a cliche, but as we'll see uh, in a moment, um, it's vital to the success of teams. And we need to start to uh, talk this way, and we need to start to move in this direction, and, um, and we need to start to measure uh, how teams actually are developing and take an interest in it. And I say that uh, you know, as, as, you know, from an executive or a organizational development perspective. So let's move on to number 10. During team meetings, the most important and difficult issues are put on the table to be resolved. So again, this relates back to my uh, sidebar discussion around team meetings. Um, the reason why the most difficult issues are put on the table to be resolved is because everybody knows or should know in a mature and functioning team that unless they resolve those difficult issues, the entire project is in jeopardy. It's no good skirting around the edges and talking about you know, all of the uh, frivolous issues when there are uh, a number of elephants in the room. And so a mature team is one, and certainly this is where the project manager uh, needs to play a, a key role, and that is in making sure that those difficult issues are put on the table and that the team members are, let's just say, deliberately meant to squirm a little bit in order to resolve them. And uh, a good uh, project manager will know that without doing that, uh, it basically just, he or she is just essentially uh, delaying the inevitable. So it's important to know what those issues are, and that only comes through conversation and, uh, and, uh, and communication, and then making sure that there is an opportunity and a mechanism by which uh, those issues can be resolved. Team members are deeply concerned about the prospect of letting down their peers. Uh, this is an amazing litmus test. Um, people tend to, if they're more on the left side of the functional area uh, matrix type design, they tend to be more concerned about that department and how they're doing in their role in that department. The more you move toward more of a projectized or balance matrix, straw matrix, projectized type organization, the more you tend to see um, people being concerned about, people on project teams being concerned about whether or not they've let down other members on the team and, uh, and less so about how they are viewed by their functional manager. So again, this is just another way of looking at the similar kind of concept that's generally going to come out of where on the spectrum you are uh, with your project team. And I think this is the last one. Team members know about one another's personal lives and are comfortable discussing them. Um, now, before you, you know, jump up and down on this point, I want to just clarify what, what, what I mean by this, uh, or actually what Patrick meant by this comment. Um, he wasn't saying that everybody should know everything that's going on in everybody's personal life. What he was saying was is that if there is something going on in your personal life, that affects the team, then it's important that people should know what that is, at least some understanding of it. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I was part of a team once where um, everything was going along fine, and then all of a sudden we had a situation where, uh, where there was a, a, a team uh, member that started to behave, let's just say in, in in a very withdrawn sort of manner. And uh, 
you know, we just assumed it was just maybe a bad day, but it seemed to carry on and it carried on until eventually this individual was struggling. Uh, they were uh, intermittent in their attendance at meetings and uh, the, uh, the sense of being withdrawn was, was greater and greater. And eventually somebody went to them and said, you know, behind closed doors and said, hey, you know, are you okay? Like, what's going on? And it turned out that this person was dealing with a very, very serious um, medical issue in a member of their uh, family. And uh, and it was obviously affecting them uh, deeply. And uh, so the 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 real question here is is not that you know that that's right or wrong. Um, each person you know has their own level of comfort with respect to how much of their personal life they want to share. And 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 uh, we need to respect that and understand that people come from different sort of backgrounds and have different uh, willingness to do that. But a really good test of a team, a team that is, as I say, mature and functioning um, at this level, um, they tend to be people who are open to sharing those things that could affect the team. And, uh, you know, they tend to be the big things in life, uh, but not always. Sometimes they're the smaller things in life. And so I think this particular and this, this last bullet point uh, tends to be one where um, if you're in a team meeting where people are sharing this kind of stuff every once in a while um, and you've never experienced that, I guarantee you you'd come away going, wow, that is an amazing team because they're so open with each other. They, they obviously, and here's this word again, trust one another um, that they can actually talk about issues like that. So um, it's, a, it's a very interesting test and uh, one that one, we, have to, uh, we have to be careful with but it, is, it does tend to reveal teams that are, are operating at a very high level. Okay, so let's, uh, oh, there's one more, sorry. Team members end discussions with clear and specific resolutions and calls to action. So again, this goes back to a discussion we had around, uh, around team meetings and whenever teams get together and discuss uh, issues, do they actually come up with uh, clear and specific answers to the issues that were discussed and then do they develop an action plan uh, to do something about it. That is a very good litmus test for uh, teams. If you can have, I don't know about you, but I've been in many team meetings where there's a lot of talk, a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, you know back and forth and around and about and up and down and things roll over in the corner and die and basically nothing ever gets resolved and so you come back together again and the issues log still has the same list of issues plus the ones from the, the previous week added to it and they're not being resolved. Um, a high functioning team is very careful about that. Um, they look at these types of things and go no we need to resolve this, we need to understand what we're going to do and then we need to put an action plan in place with clear accountability as to who's going to do what. Uh, again, this is a great litmus test for a mature functioning team. And team members challenge one another about their plans and approaches. This is a, a very interesting one and it goes back to that discussion around turf protection uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, I think that certainly in, in my own uh, career this is, this is something that I've experienced um, many times. Because I have tended to be more in a program you know, project type of role um, amongst my own team members who tended to be people who were heading up, um, you know, specific, uh, you know, functional areas like, uh, you know, in, in the pharmaceutical world, um, formulation people, uh, analytical chemistry people, clinical people, uh, regulatory people, you name it. Um, I was always in a team of other directors, if you like, um, and, but my, my role was more along program and project management and so I tended by definition to have more of an interest in the team in terms of how was the team doing, the construct of the team, uh, the management of the teams and I certainly had a very keen interest in all the project managers because they tended to report directly into myself. And it was interesting that uh, to see where uh, as, an or as the teams matured um, people took less and less interest in protecting their turf and it was okay for a team member 
in a completely different area. Let's just, I'm just choosing two arbitrarily here from my own life, and I'm not thinking of any, any one individual or any particular experience, but let's just say, for example, um, the formulation guy on the team is talking about the approach and the plan that they're going to use to do some uh, R&D for a new pharmaceutical drug. And the regulatory person, well, maybe that's a bad example because they always are, they have, they almost have a role to do that. But let's say the clinical person says, well, but wait a minute, what, you know, why are you doing it that way? You know, the person in the formulation area could say, well, you know, you're not a formulator, so why are you questioning me? I don't question you about how you do clinical studies, so what right do you have to, to criticize my uh, approach. Well, that is a, a litmus test that just failed, because basically, in a in a in a functioning mature team, um, anybody can ask anybody about why they're doing something and what they're doing. There's a willingness and an openness to being challenged, not every single day and not all the time, but um, they don't get offended when when they when somebody from another functional area of expertise questions them on the team. Uh, there's a there's a willingness to say well I'll tell you why and in fact there should be an excitement so that everybody understands and one of the things that I I often said about the you know the project teams that that I was trying to build um, I said that you know if an executive was walking down the hall and had a question a, a fairly general question about what's going on with a particular project any team member from whatever functional area they come from, it doesn't matter. Any team member should be able to answer that question. You shouldn't have to say, oh, well, that's a clinical question, so you're going to have to talk to the clinical team member. No, they should know those types of, uh, of questions. I'm talking fairly general questions now. No, not highly specific, highly detailed questions, but more general questions. Why is that? Well, it, it's because the team members should know what each other's doing. And uh, it gets back to what we were talking about earlier. Okay, one last one here. Team members are slow to seek credit for their own contributions, but quick to point out those of others. Again, standard litmus test, very, very good um, behavior when uh, we see people saying, hey, you know, uh, it, was, it wasn't uh, me, it was us. And it's that whole I versus we thing again. All right, <clears throat> so I just want to talk now about, you know, how does this happen and how do we get from where we may be on a team no matter where we are on that on the spectrum of uh, both you know uh, functional area through to project size as well as completely immature beginning just starting out with baby steps types teams right up to you know high performing self directed work teams um, which is kind of like the gold standard how does that happen how do we get there um, well uh, the good news is is that <clears throat> there's a there's an approach and there's a there's a essentially a building uh, block that that uh, Patrick lays out in his book, and he uses this um, five-layer pyramid to essentially communicate these uh, these ideas. And so I'm going to go through them um, fairly quickly with you because there's much that could be said uh, on on each one of them. But today we really just wanted to give a, a sort of high-level introduction to these concepts. Um, many of the things that I've talked about by looking at the team litmus tests. Um, are really already have kind of introduced uh, many of these and you'll recognize them as we go through. So like any pyramid, um, the most important part of the pyramid, just like the most important part of a building, is the part that you don't see and that's the part that's underground or at the bottom, uh, the base of the pyramid. It's the foundation of everything else that is built on top of it. And I can't stress that enough. The most important uh, aspect to a, a functioning team as opposed to a dysfunctional team is the foundation. And I would dare say that this pyramid is almost out of proportion. Uh, the, the bottom foundation piece should be 10 times the size of the rest of the pyramid because of the importance of this first item. And that first item is this, an absence of trust. I think that um, certainly in my 30 plus uh, uh, years in, in, um, in the industry that I've been a part of, as well as in uh, you know, uh, teams that I've been a part of outside of work, uh, you know, in my personal life, this is the most important aspect of whether a team is going to be functional or dysfunctional. 
and that has to do with the issue of trust. Trust. What do we mean by trust? We're not talking about the kind of trust here that um, you know, two people that have committed to spending their lives together kind of trust, but there are aspects uh, of that that we could draw from, even, uh, even though that would be the sort of highest standard of trust. We're talking about trust that is necessary for us to be able to function together as team members to produce something um, out of the team. And in order to do that, I have to trust you. I have to trust that you're not going to be looking for an opportunity to stick a dagger in my back the moment that I make a mistake. Or you're not going to deliberately make me look bad in front of uh, anyone. Um, you're always going to have my back. You're always going to be um, worrying about me as a team member. And I can trust you with information even in my down moments, even in those moments when I say I'm not confident with this particular thing that I'm doing on the team, even in those moments you're not going to uh, throw that in my face and say, hey, well that's your problem, you're just going to have to get over yourself, I've got my career to worry about and I'm going to, you know. In other words, there's no room for people that are willing to step on others to get where they want to go um, in a project team. It's that simple. And, you know, I know that somebody's going to probably ask this question, and so I, I think I'm, I'd like to answer it at this juncture, and that is, well, Don, this all sounds very great, and, and it, you know, you could argue it's motherhood and apple pie, but at the end of the day, this is the foundation for a functioning team. Whether it's at work or in your personal life, it doesn't matter. If you think about those teams that you've been a part of where it's worked and those where it has not worked, I guarantee you at the core of everything that was happening in terms of the success of that team, there was this issue of trust. You trusted one another. How do we get there when we have people obviously in organizations that you know, really are just looking out for number one? And I think that the, the answer to that question is we measure uh, all kinds of behaviors in business. Um, there are, there are hard skills and there are soft skills. There are hard numbers that people get measured by, whether they're in a sales organization or, a, or in a research and development organization. There are those hard numbers, and we, we understand that. But organizations uh, in the past 30 years have increasingly emphasized uh, moving away from that standard command and control type of management style to more of a um, you know, soft skill um, emphasis. And I would submit that one of the metrics that um, organizations have been reticent or maybe not even aware that they're missing, and that is how do we measure a person's ability to function on a team? Because not everybody out there is capable of being a team member, and I think that's a notion that we need to uh, dispel. Uh, I've seen situations where people talk about, well, we're going to form a project team around this, and there's like an assumption that every single person is qualified to be on a team. Well, I would submit that in my experience anyway, that's not necessarily the case. And the reason is because they have to have certain behaviors that will be conducive to their success on a team. And if they're a person, for example, that is willing to undermine another individual in order to um, improve their own, um, you know, how they look to, to higher ups, that is an automatic, to, in my mind, that's an automatic, um, you know, uh, <laughs> go to jail card because there, there's no way that you can function in a team if you're not willing to demonstrate the willingness to trust others and be trusted. And that requires an, an openness and uh, as the foundation. So this is, this is really uh, one way that I think um, organizations could move the bar a little bit in terms of having more high functioning teams, the answer is, well, measure it. Uh, have it something that is, there's a metric around that, um, some kind of 360 feedback, whatever kind of tools you want to use, but at the end of the day, if we can measure a person's um, competence in, in being able to be part of a team, then I think that that would go a long way. The other thing that needs to be said here is that 
uh, there is a spectrum of people when it comes to their ability to function on project teams. And I think that we need to provide uh, areas within businesses where people can learn, where they can flap their wings a little bit and, and fail and not be booted out, but actually be encouraged to go to the next level in terms of their participation on, on teams. And so you have teams uh, that are you know, super high functioning for people that have got the experience and the character and the, and the, and the type of skills, both soft and hard skills that have, they've built over the years that permit them to be on those high functioning teams. But you also have other teams where people are still learning, um, where they have not, this is all new to them, but they want to, you know, they, they, they want to flap their wings. And so we need to provide environments, I think, within corporations that allow people to flap their wings and know that they're not going to get, you know, booted out and that's their one shot and they, and they blew it. So absence of trust is the first dysfunction of a team. And as I said earlier, it is the foundation um, it is the most important thing. Without trust, nothing else really matters. The second dysfunction of a team is a fear of conflict. And again, you can see now, even in this first level up, why the foundation has to be uh, trust. For teams where there is an absence of trust, then obviously there will be a behavior exhibited that is a fear of conflict. I'm not willing to get into a conflict situation because I don't trust you. I'm not willing to to debate my ideas because I don't believe that you're willing to deal with me and treat me respectfully and I don't think that you really care about my ideas. All of these things are based on an absence of trust. And so what happens is Teams that don't have that trust level built um, generally struggle to really engage in that conflict uh, around ideas uh, bit that we talked about earlier. There tends to be a lot of niceties. People are very polite. Uh, people aren't rude to one another. But you notice that really tough ideas and, uh, and concepts, uh, plans are never challenged. Um, those concepts and ideas are never challenged uh, and so the team tends to be let's just say a little anemic because they don't engage in that healthy conflict and I want to I want to emphasize that that we're not talking about conflict here of personality where people attack one another sort of so-called ad hominem attacks we're talking about conflict around ideas conflicts that relate to how teams think about what needs to be done for success. And so we see that no trust, you tend to have a fear of conflict and you don't really get to deal with those elephants in the room in a healthy way. The next thing is <clears throat> that results from that, of course, is that there's a lack of commitment. And so picture a team where you, know, you have some trust issues, uh, you're not engaging in, in, in conflict around ideas, what happens the first time that team uh, gets into a situation where it's clear that, let's just say, for example, to go back to my previous example, an executive wants to uh, question what the team is doing uh, and somebody wants to make themselves look good and they say in front of the team, well, you know, I never really committed to that course of action in the first place. It was just the rest of the team why I wasn't on board. Well, that just killed the team and it set up a, a real problem. Um, it comes back to this whole thing of the foundation. If there's trust, then there's going to be uh, engagement in ideas, there's going to be some conflict around that, but resolution of that conflict, and then there's going to be commitment. Uh, without the commitment of every member of the team, there's always going to be a weakness on that team because those in, that individual or individuals will bail as soon as the going gets tough. And that's why commitment is so important to team success and why a lack of commitment is one of the five dysfunctions of a team. Avoidance of accountability. This follows from the lack of commitment, of course. You have an absence of trust, a fear of conflict, a lack of commitment, and now you're going to avoid accountability. So 
again, you can start to see now how these things all build one on top of the other. It's the natural course of events uh, for a team, and it's the natural uh, behaviors that you would see as a team continues uh, into its, um, let's just say, its dysfunction. Um, this is what you'll start to observe. Uh, you may not be aware that there's a lack of trust, but when you start to see that there's an avoidance of accountability, that the team members are not being accountable for the delivery of whatever the project is, or they're part of the project, or the team uh, deliverables, then you should be able to say to yourself, hmm, there's probably a problem further down, either a lack of commitment or a fear of conflict, or most commonly, an absence of trust. And then last but not least is an inattention to results. So <clears throat> again, in a team where you have an absence of trust, a fear of conflict, and a lack of commitment and an avoidance of accountability, you are not going to pay attention to producing what you're supposed to be producing. And this is often the classic tip of the iceberg, if you like. It's the tip of the pyramid, but it's often the tip of the iceberg. When a team seems not to care about the results, then it is usually um, a very clear indicator that they're, uh, they're just revealing the fifth dysfunction, and there are probably four dysfunctions underneath that for why that team is behaving in that way. So that's the five um, dysfunctions that Patrick Lencioni lays out. And, you know, I'm sure you've read other books where there have been, uh, you know, similar uh, types of ideas conveyed. What I like about his approach is he really spends a lot of time on the absence of trust. And I have to say, just from my own experience in, in my career as well as in my personal life, this is the, the single most important aspect if you're going to function well um, in, in, a, in a team uh, type of environment. And so it really captured my, uh, my attention uh, some years ago and I have, uh, I've always felt that uh, I'd like an opportunity to share uh, these truths and, uh, and so uh, certainly it's been great to be able to do so uh, today. Now, lastly, if you uh, have any uh, questions that you feel you didn't want to ask maybe publicly today or you'd just like to follow up with me privately, uh, you can see my email there is uh, dawndwaller at gmail.com. And uh, if you would like uh, me to come and uh, maybe talk with uh, you or your company about some of the issues that we discussed uh, today uh, or other uh, areas where I might be able to uh, provide uh, consulting support, uh, please feel free to contact uh, sales at procept.com and um, they'll uh, take it from there. So thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to present this uh, very exciting topic. I, I hope you sensed my own passion coming through on this uh, today. Uh, it's something that I have always had a passion for and uh, continue to have. So um, questions. Uh, I guess, Alon, I don't know if you have uh, if you have any uh, that have come up there or not. Um, I'm just looking at the, uh, the question area. Um, <clears throat> I see uh, one individual said, how do you deal with an untrustworthy team member who you need on a team because of their expertise? Huh, that's a great question. Um, so I'll just repeat that. How do you deal with an untrustworthy team member whom you need on a team because of their expertise? Um, well, I think there's two, two, uh, two approaches there. The first question I would ask, uh, you know, if I was, you know, talking with you is I'd say, well, uh, how do you know they're untrustworthy? And I, I presume that they've demonstrated in the past some kind of untrustworthiness. Um, the question, the follow-up question would be, well, what kind of untrustworthiness? Were they just, you know, tardy with reports, or were they people that undermined individuals and, you know, uh, chopped people to shreds behind their backs, or, you know, because those are two dramatically different kinds of untrustworthy behavior, and you have to you have to evaluate that. But let's assume, just for the sake of the question, that they they really are people that you just can't trust. You know, you you kind of you don't want them on a project team, but they know something that uh, is really important. Well, there's a number of ways I guess you could you could um, deal with that. The first is you may be forced to essentially uh, limit their um, contribution on the team to that level of expertise. In other words, um, 
you have them on the team, they provide technical input, but it's very clear that they're not part of the core. So one way to do that is not have them on a core team, but have them on an, a so-called extended team. Uh, you're recognizing their expertise, you're, you're uh, you know, granting the, that uh, if they have an ego that, you know, they're important and all, whatever they need to be stroked in order to, you know, provide what they, are, what you need to get out of them, fine. Um, but don't put them on the core team, put them on an extended team, a satellite team if you like, where if they are going to continue to demonstrate those kinds of behaviors, you can limit the impact. You don't want someone like that on a core team because as we've discussed today, you're going to just completely undermine that team and you're, you're running the risk of a whole lot of other people getting upset and not wanting to be part of the team. So you have to basically limit their ability to cause damage. And uh, so that's one approach I would take. Uh, and, and lastly, I would say that, you know, someone obviously needs to approach them and say, you know what, this is the kind of behavior that we're seeing and it's going to limit your ability to be on teams going forward. That's assuming that you have an organization that's willing to measure those kinds of behaviors. So I hope that, uh, I hope that helps. Um, thanks for that question. So I think we're at uh, just about the end of our hour. I certainly appreciate um, those of you that joined us today, um, would like to wish you a wonderful day and uh, hope you enjoyed the webinar. Please feel free to give us some feedback and uh, I hope to hear from you uh, in the future. So all the best and goodbye for today.